All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Cole Worley, and I have the privilege to be a professional game designer, which is a strange thing to say, and every time I say it, I feel stranger, not less strange. Um, and I uh, am serving as kind of like the quasi uh, director, a uh, creative director at Leader Games. That's my kind of primary job where we work on things like Root and Oath and other games that have spaceships. And then uh, I own a little historical games company with my brother called Whirly Gig, brother Drew. Uh, and we do um, weird, weird stuff for the nerds, including ourselves. Um, and our, our whole um, goal in starting our little company was that we had basically reacquired, or not reacquired, they just lapsed to us, a number of historical games that I had done while I was in graduate school, and we wanted to find a way to produce them, and instead of producing them to the standards uh, that were demanded by the publishers, we wanted to produce them based on what we thought the games demanded of themselves. Um, so some of those choices were aesthetic, like we wanted to uh, pay an ode to bookcase games, and so all the games are built in that format. But uh, some, some of it relates to gameplay. We wanted big, big, complicated history games that set up easily and that were quite approachable in their appearance uh, to audiences that don't normally play history games. Now, uh, Pamir is a fairly approachable game just in terms of the rules uh, that you have to tackle in order to learn it. Uh, and the game that we've been working on for the last several years is John Company, which is a big game. It is a absolute whale of a design and is pretty unapologetic of it, uh, about itself. Uh, and, you know, our, our hope is basically not that we um, were excited to graduate our class of premier players into John Company, but instead um, that we could make a game as big as John Company uh, more broadly um, approachable, really, uh, to that big audience. Now, what I want to do today is talk about development and not design. And usually when I give, uh, when I have little chats uh, like this one, I talk a lot about design or I talk about like, things like company structures and equity and how we try to run publishing companies differently. This talk is not like that. This talk is about something that I almost never write about and I almost never talk about, but which is probably my favorite part of the job which is the work of development, the work of taking something where the fundamentals of design are in place and having to rearrange the tensions uh, around that, around that, uh, around the problems that, that you run into. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes tell uh, one of the developers that we have at Leader Games that development really has two parts. Uh, the first part is trying to make sure the game that you're working on is as interesting as possible. And then, uh, once you feel like you've done that, you move into the second phase of development where you try not to break anything. <laughs> you try to make sure that the thing you're working on um, does not accidentally uh, destroy itself in the final stages because it can be quite, quite scary. Um, it's, very, it's almost easier to break something uh, than it is to make something, especially towards the end of a big project. Uh, so, the reason why I'm giving this talk here is because Historicon is a very important convention for my brother and I. Uh, we first went to Historicon in November of 2019, a lovely time in California, and seeing people I got to meet, like many of my wargaming design heroes, I got to meet, and have drinks with. It was it was amazing, um, and I also showed Oath uh, for I think the first time it had been shown at a at any kind of convention. I got to I got to properly show Oath. Uh, at that point, it had not even launched on Kickstarter, and I was still working out the, the details, and some of the feedback I got was invaluable, and Drew and I decided that if we were to come back to the show, uh, we would be John Company. And so when 2020 rolled around and it was held digitally, uh, we showed John Company. I think this time it was held in sometime in December, maybe. Uh, I could be wrong about that. And we showed John Company, and based on the, the reception we got, we decided to schedule our Kickstarter. Uh, for following uh, whatever it was, March, April. Uh, and so I thought this was a unique vantage point because uh, over the past year, basically John Company had been in development for about a year and a half, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, when I showed it at Historicon last year. And it has received another year of very close attention and also of money. We spent a lot of money on things like art. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we did to the game. 
Uh, and so this talk, I, I'm eager, I'm happy to see in the audience a lot of people who I saw in some of the earlier demos of the game, or folks I recognize from other places. That's great, if you already know the game. If you don't know the game, don't worry, I'm going to be talking about... Um, we're talking about the, the, the design in kind of general terms too, so that I can kind of keep everybody um, on the same page. Now, last year at Historicon, I gave a talk that was the broader design history of John Company that went all the way back to 2009, and then especially to the, the development uh, and de design passes of 2014, 15, and 16. Um, this talk is kind of the sequel. Uh, and like uh, like a good sequel, <laughs> <laughs> or not like a good sequel, I will spend a little bit of time recapping. So basically, uh, that's enough preamble. There are three little parts that I want to touch on. Uh, first, I just want to talk about the role of conventions in design. This is the shortest part. I just want to, to touch on it a bit. And then secondly, I want to give uh, everyone an overview of John Company and of the longer history of the design um, and why it is the way it is. And then third, and this is going to be the absolute majority of the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, how we polished it and some of the decisions that we made and talk about uh, you know, where we where we might have made some missteps and where we, the development really uh, really helped us out. Uh, so first of all, when it comes to game conventions generally, I realize I'm sharing a blank screen, but I didn't want to pander at you with a bad slideshow. Um, when it comes to game conventions, uh, they are one of the most important uh, from a professional design standpoint, they're one of the most important events that exist in our calendar, and I'm very excited to see them starting to come back. Because they do two very different things at the same time, which is they give you access to the other professionals and the other experienced designers who you might not normally see. They're, they're gatherings of, of industry, um, just the old guard of the industry, and you can learn a lot just by talking with them or having them play a game that you're working or puzzling over some some problem over coffee. Uh, so that's one thing that's really excellent about conventions. The other thing is that they give you access to people who you don't normally know or see. And these strangers will sometimes be quite mean to you, but they also offer just a lot of honesty. And that honesty has a real value. So in every game that I've worked on for the past five or six years, I can... I think about the game in terms of we worked on it in this phase and then we showed it at this convention and then we went back and worked on it in this other phase. And even though uh, during the past 18 months and, and, um, and everything that's happened with COVID, that has changed a little bit. Uh, but the that core kind of like when you show and when you share uh, calendar has, has remained in place. Now, John Company, so that, as, as promised, the first part of my chat was the short part. Uh, as promised, I'm going to give a little overview of John Company. Uh, John Company is the game that I uh, never stopped working on. It, uh, my first records of working on John Company date, who uh, back to, well, it must be at this point around 2008 or 2009. Um, I was at that point very uh, interested in this game called uh, Republic of Rome, um, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, Republic of Rome blew me away, uh, and I was uh, utterly obsessed with it. Uh, I had just finished my undergraduate degree, and I had a, uh, more time than sense, and so I, I, I made my own copy of this. I remember printing out some like very carefully edited living rules and going through it with a highlighter and trying to capture everything. And what struck me about this game was that it was so utterly different from any other uh, historical design I had played. And it was different because it was doing institutional history. Uh, it was trying to talk about an institution not as something that was hegemonic, as a single block, but something that had um, different factions within it that collectively determined um, the, the direction it would go. Now, at that time, in 2009, I, hadn't, I couldn't find many games um, that had the, 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 this, uh, um, this strategy, the, the, this way of approaching uh, history. And since that time, there have been a few games, and I think about Herman's work on the Statesman series, like Churchill, uh, and, and also, of course, uh, there, him and... Um, Eggleston's game uh, on Versailles, which is quite wonderful. Uh, but I was just kind of compelled by this idea and wanted to do my own riff on it. And the idea at that time was 
uh, basically, what if you made a game like Republic of Rome, but instead of being about a small fledgling state, what if you made it about a state, uh, a state-sanctioned monopoly? Something like the Dutch East India Company or the British East India Company. Uh, so that was the kind of first little I thought that 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 popped in my head, and I just kind of kept working on it, and it it never seemed to bear fruit. But as I was um, starting to design games, I I started thinking about this um, as a, as a bigger and more serious project, and eventually I had the resources to kind of attack it. The initial proposal for the game was uh, quite different. In fact, I wanted to do a game that covered all um, all of the great charter companies. So this is the very first proposal I sent to Phil Eklund at Sierra Madre Games. You can see that it's in that long box, which I think he had just debuted at that time. And the idea was that, you know, who wants a game about the East India Company? We want a game about every single great charter company. So there were all of these little uh, company placards. And, placards, I guess, and, uh, you know, so you get the Hudson Bay Company, and you could have the, uh, you could have the Levant Company, or the Africa Company, and the whole, all of, all of the East India Company existed in this small box, um, and, you know, you could, there were little maps of India, and you know, ships could be exhausted, and things like that, and then the London board here was where you went to buy your cannons, and your ships, and your goods, and the game was not good. Uh, it was it was quite bad, and uh, Phil basically said, "Well, this is interesting, but like, it's it's not really ready for us, is it?" And he he was he was completely correct about that. Um, so after I finished the expansion to uh, Pax Premier, I I realized so when I was working on Pax Premier, I had this harebrained scheme that I wanted to connect it to a game about the Caucasus and just kind of expand the map of Pamir laterally. And then what I found is when I started doing the research, I realized that Pamir worked well because it was so centered on local history. And if I was going to expand it, I wanted to deepen that connection, which is how Kyber Knives happened. And after that had happened, Phil had asked me if I had another game and I said I wanted to give the East India Company game a try, which then led to the development of John Company. Uh, now, again, I'm not going to um, go through John Company very much uh, because, you know, it's, uh, well, I already gave a talk about it, for one. Uh, here's the board, just for reference, uh, of the very first edition of John Company, which, if you've played any of the second or seen it played, you know this looks quite different. Quite busy, really. Um, I think I made this in Illustrator. This was one of my earlier Illustrator boards, I believe. Um, and, uh, I was, uh, the, the main thing I, I want, I like to communicate about John Company is that it was a game that was made under a lot of duress. I was, um, finishing a dissertation. I was trying to figure out where I was going to live. We were in the process of moving. We had just had a second child. Everything in my life was very, very chaotic. And I kept working on this and there were nights. And I, I think I've mentioned the story publicly a couple times, but, uh, I had a friend come to help, help me move. Um, and in the evenings we would play John Company and, and work on it. And I, I, I would in the morning and then in the early mornings I would get up and submit files and get things ready. And then during the day we'd pack the house. Um, so uh, this game came out, uh, and I was kind of surprised and delighted that it found an audience and people seemed to really like what it was doing. Um, my basic feeling about it now, looking back on this design, that is now, you know, I'm almost five years away from it, um, maybe even six if I think about when development happened, is that uh, I'm, there's something about this design, I think that this design is very unpolished, but I think there is something about it that causes players to be quite generous with it. So they don't mind the little irregularities and kind of amateur elements of it, because something about the scope of the game hits them and they, they, they kind of want it to work. And when everybody gets in the magic circle and decides that they want something to work, then, well, it starts working. Um, but I, I do actually think that there, there was a lot of, of, of good stuff and cleverness here too. So I'm not, I don't, there's no false modesty there. Um, so that then uh, brings me to where we were around this time last year. So uh, after, uh, when Drew and I formed Whirly Gig Games, uh, we knew that we wanted to start by launching with Premiere. It was, uh, the, of my history games, it was the one I thought 
was the most accessible. It was the one that I thought had the most interesting uh, kind of arguments, especially for people just starting off into history games. And all those uh, things kind of lined up and we decided to launch Premiere. But in the back of our mind, we thought, boy, I hope this game does well because we both really want to do John Company. So we finished doing Premiere. So Premiere's Kickstarter happened in, um, I believe, 2017. And the game came out in mid-2018. And we finished the, the, the design, I think, right at the start of 2018, like really late 2017. And at that moment, is that right? No, it, I, it's, a, it's a year ahead of that. We, started, we launched the Kickstarter for the game. Root, uh, we had started working on Premiere in 2017, around the same time I was working on Root. And we launched the Kickstarter right before it came out. So it would have been the early fall of 2018. And uh, Premiere was mostly done by that winter. And it, as Premiere was finishing, we started working seriously on John Company. Uh, now, John Company um, took a long time to get it in any kind of place. Uh, I will show you, for instance, let me sh share a funny thing. Um, let's see if I can find it. I will show you. This, this is an image I've shared before, but it's a fun, funny one to share. This is the very first um, board for the second edition of John Company <laughs> that, that we made. Um, and the, the idea here, look at my horror. I apologize about for this bad image of India, uh, which I just kind of uh, sketched. The idea was that we wanted to attack some fundamental problems right away, which is we wanted the game to have less text on the board so it was more approachable. Uh, we wanted the game to be a lot clearer to newer players. We wanted players to know it took place in India. This is a kind of strange thing, but I would get messages from folks about John Company, and they would talk about how they love talking about the East India Company because of, because of the Americas, which of course the East India Company had operations in, but John Company is about India, not, a, not about you know, the Boston Tea Party. Um, and so for that reason, I wanted, I, I, one of the primary things was, can we put a map of India on the board? That seems like a good idea. In this draft, um, the region cards, there, there were still region cards, but they sat in these boxes. And then they could also sit off board. Now, one thing that you're seeing here for people who know Adobe Illustrator is uh, you're getting a, a peek into how I work. You can see all, I've got all the sorts of weird little notes out here. But also, um, you'll note that there are these lines uh, and this is actually three p pieces of paper. So what I'm doing is imagining, like, what if the board of the game was a trifold? And that kind of material uh, constraint, at least in my design practice and development practice, is like the very first thing. Like, how many pages is your playtest kit? Um, so along those lines, um, we, sorry, I've got another screen filled with things I want to share with you all. Um, so we worked on this for a long time. Uh, basically a year passed where we were pushing on it. And about a year later, we had arrived at this. Uh, so certain things were gone. Um, you'll still see some relics of the old first edition for people who know it, like the way the orders get filled, the sh shape of the ships. Uh, this instance, we had the revenue track wrapping around India for some reason. Um, you know, but like this was kind of how things were looking. I mean, this is like directly stolen votes in Parliament from the old map. I just tilted it sideways. Um, and then, like, the, the, these prize boxes are a little similar. Uh, but basically, at this point, the game was starting to become its own thing. Now, right here, uh, the way this map worked is we had, like, order values. So the orders were worth as much money if you filled them. And then the number was how many ships it took to fill the, fill the order. Um, these arrows had to do with the, the, the progress of the elephant. Which would uh, march in this path, like the old circle. So really, I mean, we were we were in a, in a place about halfway through last year, or not last year, the year before last, where um, it, it was clear that we were working on something that was going to be done. It wasn't clear if it was going to be good. And so that then brings me to um, the work that we did in the late summer and fall of 2020 that led to the Historicon showing of the game. So let me uh, get to the problem. So here's the map that we showed at Historicon last year. Here it is. It's John Company, everyone. Um, and obviously it got a little prettier, but that's, I mean, 
that's mostly me just like muting the colors and putting a paper texture behind it. It didn't get that much prettier than it, than it had been earlier. Um, by the way, if anyone has questions, uh, I'll just say you, you can drop them in the uh, text chat and I'll have that up on the other screen so that I can I'll be able to respond to them. Um, so this is the this is the map that we showed uh, last year. Now there are uh, and then I want to con contrast this map with uh, the current map of the game. So here here's Historicon and here is the map right now. Now if we put those side to side you can see that they're actually kind of similar um, for every and, and, and I think you know the, the impression I want to give you right now is that like boy this game was getting quite close I mean the general layout is very similar um, a lot of the like things that are taking up a lot of space are the same things that are taking up a lot of space but when you start looking a little closer that falls away really fast. So here's an example. Um, I'm going to use the zoom function, and if it becomes irritating, then I'll do something else. So on the regions, you'll note that there are these little tracks. So here in Bombay, we have the track that is 5, 4. Th now what this track was, was this tracked the turmoil in the region, and as the turmoil increased, you only use the highest uncovered number for the value of the order. So if there's no turmoil and, you know, up here in Gujarat and this whole area, all the orders are worth five. As the turmoil increases, the value of the orders gets lower. Uh, so that was one little thing. Now, if you compare that over here, you'll see that Bombay here is quite different. The orders are now printed directly on them. These small values are used in the in the deregulated game, the private firm game, and I'll, I'll probably be touching on them later. Um, we also have the army boxes here. The army boxes are pretty similar, although you'll notice there are these little hats. We'll talk about those hats and how they came to be. Uh, there are no hats here. Uh, the company standing track right here, fairly similar, right? I mean, so we have the company sta standing here, but you'll notice there's no debt track. What's going on there? How strange, right? Uh, and so, and there are some reasons why why that happened. Now, at, at this point, there were actually two pieces. There was a debt piece and a standing piece that both sat on the same track. Um, quarter directors and the stock exchange, uh, basically the exact same, right? Plus one, minus one, a range of two to five, a range of three to five, like almost the same. Vacant office boxes similar, and even the phases, right? Trish and family upkeep is the same thing as the London season. Basically, family phase, firms, hiring and stock buys are the same now, hiring, the order of these offices, and then we have some things like factory profits that kind of snuck out here. Uh, but in general, you know, like what percentage of the game changed? Well, I don't know. I mean, if I were in like a copyright case or something, I would say that this game is clearly derivative of that game, right? And that, that's really what I want to jump into the weeds uh, in now, uh, jump into the weeds now and talk about, because um, all of those little changes were extremely hard won. Uh, we li literally spent months uh, sorting through some problems <laughs> that, that were resolved by, like, adjusting a number up a little or down a little. Okay, so uh, this beautiful future map, we're going to close it and not talk about it for a while and we're going to stay and live with this map. Uh, now, we're at the fourth, the third part of the talk, and the, 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 the talk, that's the part that's going to be the longest. Um, there are lots of things that changed here. And the reason why I want to talk about the things that changed is because when we're doing design work, I think design work is creative, um, and generative and really fun to talk about because what you're really talking about is the final thing and then a few of the missteps along the way. Um, but y when you're giving talks on design, you want to mostly be talking about the final thing and kind of justifying its existence. And what I want to do instead is talk about more of the engineering side of this and the very careful and slow changes and why they were made and um, and some of the missteps along the way so that you can get a sense of the labor that, that, that went into the game. Um, 
I mentioned this to the the panel I was on last night, or like not the panel, the welcoming committee I was on with, with Mark and Voco and Harold. Um, and Bobby, I, I talked, uh, Bobby asked me about the development of John Company. I said, it has spent more time in development than in design. I've spent more time just on the development of the second edition than the first edition took to realize. Um, and that isn't because this project was especially hard or even especially big. It's just because the work of development is real, is, is um, slow, and and that that's the kind of thing I want to bring to the fore here. Okay, so let's let's get into it. Um, so there are lots of different things that changed. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is how scoring worked in the game. Um, so in the original game, you would in the first edition and in the second edition, you roll for fatigue. For your families, the whole game is about you trying to get your families to re whoops, sorry, to retire, and they might start down here as a ship's purchasing officer. They might be promoted to the director of trade, and then they're going to retire to a fabulous mansion, and then they get this these victory points in, in the little shiny hexagon. Um, and one of the things I, w I wanted to do with the second edition was to make the retirements uh, more narratively rich. Um, and one way of doing that was with the, uh, well, actually, there were a few ways to do it. One way was I could put upkeeps, because if you were retiring at really fancy mansions, you had to pay for your family. And th this could create one of my favorite dynamics in the game, which is old money worried about trying to stay, like, preserve their wealth, versus new money that's just outpacing them. So you have like the problem of like it's a problem of deltas, right? Now in the in the original John Company, I had all of these fancy powers that players could could retire to, uh, and in the new one, I wanted to include those powers. So I had this notion of these prestige cards, which you can see down here in these little red boxes. Uh, so the idea was, if you retired at the sixteen pound retirement, you'd get to draw three cards from a deck. Now, what was in this deck? Let me show you. Um, oops. So the deck was filled. Here is actually the, the, the deck that was played with at Historicon last year. Uh, you can see that basically all the arts are the same. Um, and what you'll notice here is that these have, they, they look like uh, like magic cards or something, right? They have a timing window. Well, not magic cards, but like more traditional game cards, right? During the family phase, you can use this card. It lets you, during school, lets you do something. The Rotten Burrows are worth four votes. They have power awards on, or prestige awards is what they were called at that point. Um, and the the idea was that if you... I can't remember exactly the way the final scoring worked. I can uh, toggle over to that quickly. Um, the final scoring allowed you to convert your wealth into victory points, but there was another element where... Um, Oh, yeah, I remember now. So, gosh, sorry. I, it's almost as if I should have thought about this particular point before I started telling you about it. The idea was the player with the highest prestige value didn't have to return their promises. They weren't penalized for their outstanding promises. And this is my reaction maybe to, like, Trump-era politics, where I'm like, boy, if you get powerful enough, it seems like you can say anything. And so I had all these, these, little, these, these little cards. Now, uh, this was not good design. It, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work for a few reasons. One of them is the internal balance of these cards was like a little goofy. And if you started making them interesting, what happened was uh, there was, it was too noisy. Like you would get three of them, which may be synergized with your position perfectly, or maybe they didn't. And it also meant that players would stop negotiating using their promises because if, a play, if the promises were going to be worth nothing from a player who had the most... Um, then why would you bother uh, trading them in the first place? Which means these were so valuable that players didn't even trade them. So it was uh, really, these were failing on almost every way that a particular mechanism could fail. It also uh, wasn't dramatic. It, it wasn't adding anything to the story arc of the game because you would just take as many as you could. You would just cash out and then you get a bunch of little baubles and maybe they were good and maybe they were now, let's talk about how the new design works. So uh, here, again, is the new board. And you'll notice one difference between the new board and the old board 
So uh, we have these estates, right? Here they are. And we have the, the value of the estate in the top left, and there's the upkeep cost. So that those basically stayed the same. The prices did go up a little bit. Uh, and then there are two other, uh, then we have the victory point value on the right. Uh, all of these, all of the art is done by an artist named Yannick, uh, whose last name has suddenly escaped me. Uh, he's also doing the art for Horseless Carriage. Fabulous. Uh, 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 I'm going to mispronounce it, but uh, Yannick's done amazing work. Uh, the, the credited artist, he does most of the, he's done most of the layout on the board, uh, and he redid the icons. So these are the victory point values right here, and then uh, above these beautiful estates, we have some window icons. Now, window icons we'll talk about a little bit later, but basically they are uh, liabilities for being rich folks. And, uh, and I'll talk about them more when we get to the law phase, because it's one of my favorite historic details from the, from the game. So if I don't talk about windows, you must remind me, and I will, I will talk more about what the window icons do. Uh, but the other thing that's been added to this board is the London season display. Now, this was not on the first board. There was the get a vacant offices display, but we did not have this lovely art piece. Most of the art piece is done by a guy named Thomas Rawlinson, who's a caricature artist from around the same period as James Gilray in the late 18th century. Uh, the London season display, now the way this works is uh, these are the cards, the really cool power cards that are going to be available to all the players. So let me show you how they work. Um, there is a deck of these prestige cards which are going to be displayed. I guess I should have shuffled them, shouldn't I? So I can see um, some of their variety. So there's a deck of these prestige cards that are hanging out in the London season. And when we retire our family members, the player who spent the most money on the London season, on retirement, they get to draft first from this pile. So they might say, aha, I bought the fancy house, everyone loves me, I'm going to marry the widow of, uh, who owns a Scottish castle, and they gain this fabulous card. And then some other player could make other, other choices. Uh, and what this did was it gave the game a bit of the character of a Regency period piece or some kind of Victorian novel, where you got a lot of players in essentially an auction, where they sometimes will need to borrow money from each other to try to edge out their rivals, and that generates lots of interesting debt. And what are they doing it for? They're doing it for these little baubles, which have other gameplay effects. Now, uh, some of the gameplay effects from those old prestige cards were quite mean. I really wanted them to be in the game. And so we kept them in the game with these things called blackmail cards. And these are shuffled into the deck. And the way this works is if they are on the London season, they sit face down. And the idea here is that when we're taking turns, drawing, drafting our card from the London season display. And there's always only three, no matter the number of players. Uh, anybody whose turn it is to pick is welcome to peek at this blackmail card. And they can choose to take it or not take it. So it's possible that like player one peeks at it, decides they don't want it, takes this guy instead. Player two decides to peek and decides to take. Player three gets this. And in that, ver in that game, what I love about this is that player one and player two know what this card is. So this card starts to feel really like a dirty room. And it creates a really lovely asymmetry of information. Now let's talk about what these blackmail cards do. So they all have this lovely ornament on them. Here's the Envoy to the Moves. These are all single impact cards that are very powerful. Uh, they're blackmail. I mean, you, you can use them as leverage to kick people out of offices. They're scandals. They're company frauds. Uh, some of them reward players with power, uh, which, uh, which is an important uh, thing that you can gain that you can use for scoring. Um, and so these are just good, good cards to have uh, and can be extremely powerful. Now, the last kind of prestige card are these spouses. And uh, there used to be a card in old, the old John Company um, that was a wedding card where players could, could marry each other. Um, and it was one of those cards that had it was a great idea, but it just never really worked the way I wanted it to work. And I wanted to make sure that spouses were in the game because marriage is one of the most important parts of how the English gentry does social climbing. And so how I decided to do it in this design was to say, uh, you know, if you get a spouse like Lord Highgate here, he's worth victory points, and you cannot transfer this card. You are part of Lord Highgate's family now. Good work for you. Bully. Uh, but every spouse has a restriction. And if, you're, if you've got Lord Highgate, you can now only retire prizes worth eight victory points or higher. 
So you can't score any of these cheap prizes anymore. I mean, you can still score them, you just can't retire new ones. Esther Summerson, which if you've read Dickens's Bleak House, you'll know all about her, um, stops you from ever taking blackmail cards. If you have Esther Summerson, you cannot take blackmail cards for the rest of the game. And any that you currently have must be uh, traded or discarded. So basically, all the spouses give the players gameplay restrictions, which in the long campaign game, the families you marry into create a lot of interesting pressures in, in the late game. Uh, okay, cool. So that's how the London season changed. Um, and it created a lot of tension and really allowed the attrition system to work. Uh, okay, so let's talk next about presidencies. So uh, there are three presidencies in John Company. Uh, these are the administrative regions that were, um, um, I don't know, designed by, by the company to administer the, their trade. Um, the story here is that India is a quite a large place and it's hard to communicate with each other. So they basically, instead of having everything run out of one city, at least in the early years, they tried splitting their trade operation among different parts of the, of the continent. And indeed, the, the sorts of things that are being traded at each of these ports are quite different. So in John Company, these presidencies are associated with different regions. So you have Bengal presidency, of course, with Bengal, Madras with Madras, Bombay with uh, Bombay. Now, which is Bombay is down here as a city. Um, now, uh, uh, one thing I'll mention is that all of these regions are weird approximations. So, for example, like the Maharathas are like really over here. Um, but then they kind of grew to take over a lot of the central provinces. Um, whereas Bombay is here kind of like the Rajaputs are up here and Gujarat's right there. Um, and so I had to kind of glom things together. It's like a weird melding of 150 years of Indian history and the Victorian imagination, not the Victorian, but the British imagination, the Georgian imagination. And so when you glom all those things together, you're going to get a weird app like this one. Um, okay, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so the presidencies went through several different um, adjustments. Um, one of them, which is actually one of the last adjustments that we figured out, was an order of operation adjustment. So for a long time, whenever a region was conquered, so you'd have like Bombay might conquer itself or uh, the, the, the company might take control of Bombay and then maybe takes control of Hyderabad. When they do that, the Hyderabad piece would sit on this ribbon right down here. And when you were resolving the order of the game, when after you finished the Bombay presidency, you would resolve that little ribbon. Uh, and you'd say, okay, now it's time for the governors to act. Uh, and what we found was that um, this didn't make the presidents feel like they were really in charge of anything, and it created kind of static action chains. chains. So very recently, we've adjusted, uh, not very recently, but a couple months ago, we, we readjusted how the order of operations works so that the presidents have a number of positions that are um, that they're in charge of and they get to decide the order of operations. So when it's the president's turn, they can say, okay, I want these governors to go first, and then they go and say, okay, now I want this position to go, and then I'm going to go last. Or they can decide to go first for whatever reason. Um, and, and that was just one change where it actually, sometimes there are very interesting things to negotiate, and other times there isn't much to, to do at all, and the president can just kind of gavel in and say, hey, we're going to go very fast through this, I'm just going to take a quick trade, and then we, we, move, we move right along. Um, okay. So the next thing that uh, was really dramatically changed were the governor cards. Uh, this is actually maybe the most dramatic site of, of change in the whole design. So let me uh, draw those up for you. Um, so here is an old governor card. There he is. That's Clive, by the way, um, looking, looking, you know, very full. Probably just had his roast. Um, so uh, the governor of Bengal, you'll note that uh, governors have two jobs. They, uh, they can invade adjacent to Bengal. So the, the governors are in charge of the military engine, uh, and that's very much a artifact of the first John Company. And then their second action is they get to remove chaos in Bengal. So they can, they can remove turmoil and make the region a little better to trade. And then at the bottom, you'll notice they have a special bonus, which is they get one per space without chaos there. So uh, if, they, if they take that second action, they can make more money. Now, this really, uh, th th this version of the governors never worked very well. 
and and the reason it didn't work well is uh, they were much too powerful because they were in charge of all the military growth. And second, they were incentivized to be really good actors because that was where the most lucrative actions came in. So the, the governor turns were very boring because they would spend money so that they could make more money next turn. And then that was it. That was kind of all they did. They just had this little like loop where they would, they would be like constantly cleaning up. So we went through uh, probably a dozen different governor um, systems, including a version where governors could build uh, plantations for the planting of cash crops. And the problem with all these systems is they would create a little self-reinforcing loop where uh, a player actor would p play in a way that increased their action potential for the next round. So they would play in a way that increased their action potential for the next round, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of looping can be very useful in like the world of Euro games, but it's very bad for a negotiation game. It's very bad for games interactive as John Company. So what do we do? Um, well, the, the main thing that had to be figured out is we needed to create a leaky system. And that leaky system was created with uh, the administer action. So here's Clive again. This is from the, 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 current, the current kit. And th these cards are quite close to done, to being totally done. Um, so here, here's Clive again, the governor of Bengal. Um, and he may take administer actions. And he has a dice pool of four cards. I'm sorry, four cards, what am I saying? Four dice. So he has, he has an initial dice pool of four dice. You'll note the governors have different size dice pools. It's usually three or four. And he will roll those like any other check in, in John Company, which is that you roll a number of dice and you only count the lowest roll. And if it's a one or two, you're successful. And he has three things that Clive can do. He can make money for the company or the president. That's what the thing on the left is. He can uh, commission a regiment. Can like build a little army unit, and he can also start building a company ship. And if he makes money for the company or for his president, uh, he has to add an unrest cube after he's done it once. And if he fails these rolls, he has to add an unrest cube. And what are these unrest cubes? What are they doing? Well, the unrest cubes are very very important because if the governor is screwing around and being uh, you know, taking a lot of actions for whatever reason, they add these unrest cubes. And what these unrest cubes do is when there is a revolt in this region, or a, revol a revolt anywhere that triggers a revolt in this region, every one of these unrest cubes increases its strength. So the more actions the governor takes, the more he, dis he potentially disrupts India. Now, why would, he, why would he bother to take these actions if it has a bad thing? Well, every time the governor takes a successful action, he makes a buck. So the governor then is now in a situation where they're incentivized to act because every action makes them some money. But there's a possibility that with each of those actions, it's going to destabilize India. And critically, 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 the governor cannot clean up their own mess. Uh, the governor has no way to get rid of unrest cubes. Uh, that's just not it's just not on their card. In fact, you'll note that the governor has no military um, role at all. They have no military actions here. And that brings me to these hats that I alluded to early. So one thing that happened in the past year is that we realized that the first edition's linking of the governors to the uh, military apparatus of the East India Company was a bit of bad history. Or it wasn't quite bad history. What it was was a bad abstraction because the governors were often self-centered and corrupt and made often made much more of a mess than they than they helped with uh, but and, and uh, the military officers behaved in much the same way but they weren't necessarily always the same person so what we did was we created a system where in the uh, office of military affairs Part of their role in the game, their position, and I'll actually I'll grab that card so you can see it. Plus, I like this guy's beard. Um, mm. So, in the military affairs position, you get to transfer your officers and regiments. And regiments, by the way, are just like military strength points. Uh, and then you get to uh, assign officers uh, in training. And I'm realizing that there's a missing line here because one of the most important things that you do uh, is that you appoint commanders. 
Um, that just must be a slightly old card. Um, so the way this works is the last step of your military affairs action is you get to appoint your commanders. And the commander goes to the player with the most officers in the army. Now, this commander, uh, so Green here is in charge of the army of Bengal. Uh, they act at the president's command. The, the president has to give them an opportunity to act, but they act when the president says they can act. And it is the armies that get to make the decisions about cleaning up unrest, conquering new regions, deciding you know, how, uh, how defensive to be or how offensive to be. Um, and the, the commanders are incentivized to um, do two things. One, they're incentivized to generate loot. And so what happens is when a region is conquered, it has a value in loot that is then split among the commander and all of the pieces that were part of the invasion. So the, the, more, the higher the tower and the higher the uh, loot token, the more value is going to be generated. But if a commander goes marauding around and just takes over a bunch of the map and exhausts their big army, when the elephant comes around in the event phase, they could lose their job. And it's a very bad thing to be a commander that loses the, the, their job. You can lose quite a bit in the game. So the, the commander has to balance how risky can I be with my own um, greed and um, a, a, against the, the potential for quite serious losses. Um, and of course, you know, that, all, that, that can include causing the game to end early because every conquest of a company region moves the company towards uh, failure. Uh, these unrest cubes allowed us to do something else that's really fun, and this kind of uh, bleeds into a, one of the next points I want to make, um, which is uh, how India expresses itself in, in this design. Now, uh, it, it's going to be quite difficult for me to get really, really in the weeds here with how the event system has changed, but one of the ways is uh, these arrest cubes allowed us to do things um, like create the mutiny. Now, the mutiny, the, the 1857 mutiny, um, was always, I imagined, like an in-game condition for John Company. Like, if, you know, the, the mutiny happens, the game is over. Uh, and because it was a complete failure of the East India Company to, uh, to sort of deal with the thing that they had helped make. Um, and it could happen in John Company, but it happened very rarely. And so one thing that we did is we made it so that these unrest tokens, the way they work, is if there's ever an attack against the, the company, there are additional attacks in every region with unrest cubes. And if, the, if there's enough armies in the right places, the company can deal with it and kind of, kind of like hold martial law. But if the company spent all of its armies cleaning up last turn's mess or doing something silly, uh, a single cube can tilt everything over. And that, I mean, when I think about my understanding of the mutiny, it's really that lots of pressure being applied in lots of different places at the same time. Um, the fact that it wasn't always a coherent single movement uh, didn't matter because the company couldn't respond to such variegated, variegated threats. Um, so there have been lots of other little adjustments to how India works and its abstraction. So one of them was it used to be that you had to build opium plantations in order to get the trade with China started. Uh, we went ahead and just stuck those directly on the map so that if you have those regions conquered, it will provide you with with an, a, an amount of opium for, for trading. Uh, and one of the, the development lesson here is basically we want to make the company have a different amount of access to uh, opium and we want it to be expressed through what the company chooses to conquer and develop. Um, and is there a way that we can do that without adding an action? So much of the work of development is, hey, I want this cool thing to happen, but I don't want to write a paragraph in the rules about it. Um, okay. Uh, these loot tokens were uh, ad additions later um, to try to g get the map. Um, because I, you know, I want to show things that, like, yeah, conquering the old capital is going to be a lot more profitable than just conquering some places in the central provinces, uh, or certainly like trying to make a workable campaign in the northwest frontier. Um, there have been other little things too. So, for instance, uh, one of the events that can happen in the game is a turmoil event. Um, I'll find one. Maybe I won't. Um, well, there are these turmoil events. And uh, there's one. And turmoil events affect the northernmost closed region. And this is a lovely thing because it means that all the regions have more and less dangerous orders in them. Uh, this one, yeah, it's fairly clear. 
Uh, I have to always double check the math in case we've been scooting things around that we shouldn't be. Um, but uh, this is great because it means if I put a writer here, uh, he is more likely to get bumped off by a turmoil event than a writer spent there, which then allows me to, to tweak these numbers to make the more northernmost orders like tend to be a little bit better. Um, the peace event too is a, uh, went through some interesting evolutions. The way it works now is basically both regions uh, that are on either side of the elephant, they, they grow taller because they're, you know, it's peace. And then also any uh, orders on connecting regions get cleared off, which then starts to open the, the board for trade. Um, these orders themselves are, are new. The, the, the fact that, um, you know, the older versions of John Company, let's see if I can quickly toggle to the old map. Nope, there. Um, the older versions of the map of the game, uh, they had those unrest tracks, right? And what we did instead was say, no, like, let, let's let the, the unrest tracks sit on the map itself. And so as the region gains unrest, we mark them with these closed tokens and it becomes harder to trade in them. Um, and then uh, to that line, you know, if there's a, a revolt, so for example, at the very start of the game, it's quite possible that the, you know, the, um, the central provinces are under the sway, Marath is under the sway of, uh, second, I'm just going to set up a scenario here. They're under the, the sway of the Mughals, right, at the start of the game. And if they successfully revolt, they get their independence, good for them, uh, and, and the, the, the Mughal Empire contracts. But then uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole region closes for trade because it's in turmoil. So th this made the company very attentive to uh, shifts in fate among what was happening. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Um, oh, right. And then uh, th this is truly, I mean, this is the kind of stuff I normally am just not allowed to even mention in, in, in design chats because it's, it, it seems so mundane. But one of the things that we really worked on was getting the regions to be the proper amount of belligerent towards the company and towards each uh, each other. And so one thing that we do what, that we did is normally after you resolve an event that has to do with the elephant, the elephant will march. And it will march to the region listed on the top of the stack. So this elephant marches to Maratha, and it's going to sit on the square, which is up here. So it'll sit on the little, little square border. That means Maratha has revolted from Delhi, and now they want to take it back. Now, as we're flipping events, we might come to a crisis. And after we resolve that crisis, so for example, let, let's imagine that um, the Marathans uh, kind of turn this on their head, and they succeeded in their crisis they conquered delhi and they're, they're creating a new a new empire here um like that and then at the bottom of this you'll note that there's a little elephant arrow but now there are two arrows it points either way and right. the, arrow, the arrow on the left what that means is if an empire what was enlarged or created then what you're going to do is you're going to have the elephant direct itself to the triangle next and if the triangle was already conquered, it would direct itself here next, which means successful empires will tend to grow as opposed to just falling apart. And so it just makes the event system a little bit more fluid um, and, and creates, um, you know, we, we want the behavior of India to be um, sort of predictable, but also very organic and just chaotic enough to make it feel like it's really like a, a place that you don't understand. Uh, which is true of the subject position that the players are being asked to inhabit. Um, okay, cool. So I've got two more things I want to talk about. I realize I'm running a little low on time, but because I, I know it was supposed to be an hour, but um, I, I'll go for a little bit longer. Uh, so the, one of the things I'm most proud of, of all of the development changes that were made, um, was, and I actually, quick sidebar. Uh, I didn't talk about these friends. Uh, in the old game of John Company, you could buy mercenaries. And I always hated... I liked the the idea of the mechanism, but I didn't like how it presented itself in the game. And those have been restyled as local alliances, which have prices that you can use to get them to join you, and then they have strengths. And I really like this because it introduces just the names of significant political actors in, in the period, and, and they can be quite, quite important and useful. Uh, again, depending on the creativity of the players. 
Okay, so now I want to talk about one of the things that I'm most proud of in the development of this game, uh, and that is the law system. So the old law system in John Company was uh, uh, very straightforward, very old-fashioned. There was a deck of law cards. You'd flip one, and you'd have to vote on it. And um, in the development of the game, I this never rang right. And part of the problem was that I had a deck of 20 or 30 odd law cards and in a six turn game you saw six. Now I want the law cards to feel like tools. They should feel like instruments so that if the players are struggling in one way or another they can say okay what if we can get Parliament to do this? And if they can do that it'll, it'll open up the game. But in a six turn game or a five turn game you're only going to see five of those cards out of a big stack. So they're going to feel arbitrary. It's a little bit like, imagine going to the pharmacist and they just hand you a random pill. They're like, do you want to take this or not? And you're like, well, I don't, this isn't exactly what, why I wanted to come here. Um, and so I, I went through a lot of different versions and I came up with this totally absurd policy track. And this was come up with at a kind of funny time. Uh, the, the game was gelling very well. We were preparing for the Kickstarter and I had just sent my review copy to Dan Thoreau at Space Biff. Um, and I was very excited for him to play the game, but I knew the law system wasn't quite right. And then at the very last minute, I was like, oh, wait, Candyland. What if laws were like Candyland? I'd just been playing Candyland with my kids. Um, and I had this, like, wild epiphany, and I, like, went downstairs and drew it up, and within, like, five or ten minutes, I completely convinced myself that this was the right way forward. Uh, and I put it in the game, without hardly testing it, and was so enamored of it that I did something that I almost never do, which is that I sent Dan an email and said, Dan, uh, I'm going to send you a two-page PDF. Can you print it and stick it on your board that I just mailed to you? I swear to God, this game is actually done, and it's actually getting close, and I, I, I looked like such an amateur at that moment. But this system basically stuck around. Um, so here's how it worked. And this is going to be a little hard to explain with a cursor, but I'll do my best. Um, so hopefully uh, you can see my mouse move around here. Um, basically, there's this funny little Candyland track. And you'll note that there are a few different icons, such as the one pound icon, or the prestige icon, or the little X icon. Now, the X icon is, is a tax. And then you'll also note, and the, the one pound uh, icon is a bonus. That's good. You make some money. And then a power icon uh, gives, gives prestige and power. So that's the little frame. Then you'll also notice that the icons also have colors. But the colors don't line up with the shapes. So for example, here we have a tax icon on pink, which means it's associated with luxuries. And then here we have one on blue, which means it's associated with shipyards. I'm sure I've lost many of you, but hold on. The idea here was that when you flipped a law, the law would say, hey, pick a tax. And you would have a big pawn, and you would have to choose the nearest tax if you were prime minister. So you'd say, okay, i got to tax someone. Is it going to be luxuries? Or do I want to move my pawn counter or clockwise to workshops? And what this did was it linked every single law power with a um, with, with, with a policy that could be relevant. So maybe the law was not super interesting this game, but the policy could be very divisive. So it just like let the, the political system reach a little bit. And then as we were developing it, we realized there were all of these interesting implications. And we eventually moved to a system where we turned the political system into kind of a little mini game. And I'll show you how it works. So. Um, we went through a lot of development. Actually, before I show you this, I have to show you something really lovely, which is this dang policy track uh, was one of the most frustrating things I've ever had to design in my entire life. I have on my computer like probably 30 different versions of this track, and some of them are as inscrutable as this one, but others uh, are worse. And uh, eventually I came up with this solution. Uh, and you can see here that th th this is a big token that is held by the Prime Minister. And you can see that it says, like, power, and then has the icon. And then the icons are also associated. And then, uh, so this is a funny thing, because uh, the enterprises in the game, like uh, workshops and, and luxuries and things, have colors associated with them. I thought that was the dominant color. But actually, uh, 
it made it more easy in terms of the visual hierarchy to put the policy type, power, bonus, tax, whatever, to color that, and then to let the icons do the talking for the other thing. Now, the other fun thing I like about this is that uh, his arm spins. Um, and this is my way of interjecting, hopefully, a little bit of Victorian whimsy into what is otherwise a very serious game. Uh, and the notion here is that the prime minister is going to point at whatever they want the current policy to be, uh, like taxing on the shipyards. Now, if they screw up, if this law fails, critically, the leader of the opposition, because this is a parliamentary system after all, the leader of the opposition gets to choose an adjacent policy. So if they go and try to tax the rich or tax the shipyard owners with, with this law uh, and they lose, uh, the rich people can get more powerful or the shareholders can generate a bonus. Those are the two adjacent, adjacent pieces. Um, okay, so that was one part of the political system. The other part of the system was redesigning the laws themselves. So on the uh, prime minister's turn, so one player is the prime minister, they have this token, and they're also going to have a little stack of law cards. The first thing they do is they flip a law card. They say, ah, yes, the law before parliament is the board of control. And if it passes, here's the cool effect. And before I launch into it, I need to decide a power objective, which means I can go clockwise to power for shipyards, or I can go counterclockwise and give power to the top hats. So I don't know. Do we want to eat the rich and vote for shipyards, or do we want to enable the rich? Aha, we want to enable the rich. Now, if this fails, the proletariat is going to strike back and take one of the two adjacent things. Maybe we don't want that. But this is the critical, critical thing that we, that we change in development. The prime minister can draw up to three cards. So they could say, you know, I don't really like this one. It doesn't really suit me. I'll flip another one. Ah, the window tax reveal. This one is a top hat policy, which means I can go to the clockwise top hat, counterclockwise top hat. And in this instance, they're both taxes. So they're both bad. Now, that might seem like it makes this choice kind of null, but actually, in what it opens up for the opposition to take, it can be quite different. So there's a lot of, there's, there is strategy in every single policy decision the prime minister makes. Now, maybe they don't like that either and they want to turn another card. And they turn a card, and they turn a card. And you might ask yourself, well, of course, the prime minister is always going to turn their maximum three cards because they want the maximum options. And indeed, that often happens. And this allows us in a single five-turn game to get through 15 laws out of a deck of, you know, 23, 24 cards instead of five out of 23, 24. So this is a much more, uh, much better coverage. Uh, but there had to be some risk involved. And so some of these laws are not laws at all, but dilemmas. If a dilemma is drawn, these two cards are immediately discarded, basically, and you have to deal with the dilemma. And some of these dilemmas are horrible, such as public demands impeachment, or, um, you know, relief demanded for an Indian famine, something that rarely happened. Um, but these dilemmas will basically force your hand. So if you're, if you're dilly-dallying as the prime minister, the risk that you're playing is that you're going to get a dilemma, and these dilemmas are often very unkind to you. And if you lose your, I mean, if you, um, you know, this is a parliamentary system, so, it, and, and, and this is from an age where if you brought a policy to the table or, and it failed, you were not going to be prime minister much longer, and the wheel is going to spend to someone else. So that's how the policy system and the, the political system works. Um, I like this system so much. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a game about municipal politics right now, and this system is the centerpiece to that game. I'm gonna, I want to build a whole game around it. I think it's really interesting, and it, it, it just bears out uh, in a, a very clean and abstract way some of the essential problems of, uh, of dealing with, with uh, legislative politics. Okay, so... Um, oh, one other small change, uh, change, and this is just an ergonomic thing. Uh, you know, when I first worked on this game for the legal phase, I had this rule that for the law phase that the the prime minister would gavel in the session and then would allow people to speak, and it was kind of free form, like anybody could vote at any time. And if you wanted to vote, and then later you wanted to up your votes or something, you could you could speak again. And I like this in abstract in the abstract, but it was just garbage in play because uh, players. Um, they would either get too into the mode, mood or not into it enough. 
And any game that demands players navigate that kind of th decision, I think, can have some have some trouble. And so we changed to a system where basically you do a round of voting, and then the prime minister decides, do I want to stop? I keep going. So if the prime minister finds themselves losing, they could say, okay, we're doing another round. And uh, th this continues until the players need... Um, you know, the, the players won't want to stop. And what I like about this is, it like the, pre the change to the presidency operations, it lets the round be as long or as short as it needs to be. Some laws are going to be very obvious. They're going to have a single voting round. Other laws are going to involve players burning down their player positions to try to get something to pass uh, because they can have really big impacts. Um, so, uh, last thing, I, I have two small things I want to talk about. Uh, one of them has to do with final scoring. Uh, so final scoring went through many changes, and where we're at right now is that, or where, where we're going to be, frankly, is that uh, players on get a power award based on how much power they've accumulated. So various things in the game, such as uh, holding the prime minister, give players power, which is this little icon with the little curly vine things. The player with the most power is going to get an amount of victory points, and second most power is going to get a smaller amount of victory points. And that number scales up over the of the game. Now what this does is it creates a kind of like secondary victory, soft victory point market that can be quite interesting, but one of the big things is uh, these power policies on this track, what they do is they enable you, like let's say you win a, uh, a workshop power policy, that's the one on the top left, or the, the kind of mid left, um, that allows you to take the workshop I, uh, power piece and swap it with an adjacent power piece. And now all the all of the workshop enterprises or the manufacturing enterprises are worth one power. And if another workshop power is one, they can be worth two. So this creates a kind of fun zero sum game where the, that that uh, allows you know changes in society and culture and political fortune to be kind of mapped very cleanly and simply uh, onto a game system. And you know just kind of thinking generally, even when this game has a ton of pieces on the board, it is still so much simpler and so much more approachable than uh, the first edition. And one of the things I think I'm really happy with in this design is this design is very big, uh, but Despite its size, I think that it, uh, it, it isn't hard for a player who's willing to really dig into the history to, to learn how it all works. Um, okay, so very last thing I want to talk about is firms. Uh, John Company is, for those who aren't familiar with it, it has a very funny um, mode built into the design, which is a mode that allows players to uh, run their own mini companies. Uh, basically, what happened was in 1813, uh, and at different times and, and in different scopes, um, the company lost its state-sponsored monopoly uh, and deregulated, and small private firms were able to start trading. Now, there had always been some degree of quasi-illegal trade with England happening from private firms, but it really became uh, state-sanctioned in the early part of the, of the 19th century. So I wanted to put those firms in. Uh, but this has always presented a problem because when we're all working together and hanging out in the company and stomping on each other's faces, we're having a good time. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's bearing out the arguments of the game very cleanly and beautifully. Uh, but if you go off and start your own company, then we don't hang out anymore. And the game starts losing its tension. So one of the goals of the firm game was to figure out how to make the firm game as interactive as possible. Now, one of the biggest ways we did this was building this map. Because now, as the firms fill orders, and they use these kind of generic writers when they're filling orders, when the firms fill orders, uh, the way this works is, you know, one firm might fill these three orders and make four, seven, ten pounds. And then if another firm comes after them, they have to trade from the same home port, but they only make the half rounded down value. So that the firm that comes that comes next rolls, you know, makes two. Uh, oftentimes, it is, of course, le less than half total. Um, so, to do this, we had the idea of initiative. So here's the firm board, right? uh, and there, I feel like I could give like a three-hour talk about the design of firms in this game. They got so much more development than the firms in the first edition. Just there were dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of games where we played with the firms. Uh, and we got them very, very, very good uh, in a very, very good place. So um, 
I'm going to talk about a few different elements of how they work, and then I'll, I'll take questions for 15 minutes or so, or however many questions people might have. Um, the first thing is about how the trading works. So firms now have this, uh, they have a, a trade policy um, where every turn they're going to take an amount of money. Imagine that this token is money. Uh, and they're going to commit this stack of money to a secret trade policy. And then, so this is Bengal, and then when we're resolving the order of operations, when we get to the start of the presidency of Bengal, any firm that has Bengal says, me, 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 I've got Bengal, and they will roll dice equal to the amount of money they invested. So let's say they invested five or something. So they invested five pounds in their Bengal trade. Uh, and we'll, we'll give this firm, I don't know, three ships. Now, what they do at this point is they're going to roll these dice. And the, congratulations to them that they had a successful roll. Uh, but, whereas in all the other actions of the game, one success is kind of enough and you don't worry about the rest of the roll, the firm game is handled a little differently. Every firm has an initiative value. And the initiative value is the number of ships minus the number of successes. So this small firm has three ships and they rolled two successes, so their initiative value is one, and you want a low number. That means that they are, so, so their initiative value, let's say, is one. Now, let's say that the company in Bengal had, you know, five ships, so they're very strong, right? And the company uh, in India also wanted to roll five dice, so they roll their five dice, and their initiative value, they got one success, is five minus one, for four, which means when it comes to the trade order, huzzah, the firm goes first and fills one, two, three, and then all firms get to fill a bonus order. They fill one more than the number of ships they have. So this firm fills these four orders. And then when it comes to the company's turn, they've got five ships, but they are getting sloppy seconds on these. And then that one probably. And so the firms are now directly competing with the company, and uh, it's allowing me to capture like the agility of a small company with this new initiative system. So that initiative system, by the way, was the most gradual evolution. Like it was in place early on, but the notion that firm size should impact the initiative system took almost a year to figure out to get it to to work right. Um, I mean, it, it really took a, a long. Time. Um, so, uh, how do firms work in, uh, outside of that? So, th there are a couple other small points I want to touch. So, one of them is um, firms give players access to special re retirements. So, when a firm pays out dividends, um, which, uh, like any other place, like let, let's say, you know, this is a firm owned by the Sykes, the Sykes family, they own two shares and Yellow owns one. If they're paying out dividends, the way that works is it's like it's similar to the company where you pay one dividend. So you, um, each dividend here costs one for each share and then one for the manager. So in this case, it would be you know four bucks per dividend. So they go Sykes makes three, Yellow makes one, and then the, you know they've just spent four pounds out of their India treasury, which is money they made from trade, uh, and then they can keep doing that. Uh, to, to pay out as much money as they'd like. Uh, the more money firms make in trade, the more their value increases. So for every six pounds that they make from trade, the value increases a spot, and that tells you how much, how many victory points every share is worth in the company. So you know the start. If if they build a trade and it, if they build build a firm and it just bricks and doesn't do anything, it might be worth minus one point or zero point or even just half a point. Um, okay, so then, uh, that's not all. Uh, the other, so why, why would you want to be in a firm? Well, one of the things that firms give you access to is when a firm pays out dividends, it marks the total amount of money it spent. Let's say it paid out three dividends. Each one cost four, so for a total of 12. When it comes to retirement, any player who has a share in this pink, purpley firm they are allowed to make a retirement as if they had a pensioner and they can spend up to $12. So any of these spots 
can be bought like as a quote free retirement. They still have to pay for it, but they don't actually need to have the pensioner. This means that firms can still fight in the London season, even though they're not in the company. One of the things that would happen in the old game is that players who were running the firms were just playing for the firm scoring conditions and they weren't actually engaging with the, the retirement market, which was a bummer because the retirement market was such an interesting part of the, of the design. And this, this melds them together much more cleanly. Uh, and then the last thing about firms is how shares actually uh, come about. So um, shares can be traded. You know, if, if, if purple wanted out, for instance, they could, they could sell their trade to yellow. That's completely fine. Uh, they can't be destroyed freely or, or merged or anything, or not merged, but it can't be combined or anything like that. But uh, the way you get money, and this is a very critical new thing, um, the way you get money into firms is not just by tossing money into the firm. Instead, there are two ways. Uh, if the company is in good standing, which is to say if neither one of its pawns is on one of these lined spots, then you can take shares that you own and you can throw them away. And instead, you take this share and you have sold it, and it becomes a share in the company, and the, the company makes five pounds. And so this, this allows people to convert their uh, company positions into firm positions. Uh, usually, the company is in a bad way so that you don't have the ability to just like run away from the company into a firm because your shares are weak, they're not worth anything. Uh, so the other way you can do it is you can, the other way to get money into firms is you can buy workshops or you can find players who have workshops and they can choose during the firm phase to invest them. Now an invested workshop, I'll show you how different it is from a regular workshop, still counts as a workshop, still is worth votes, but no longer makes income each turn and no longer operates as a hedge against the company. And so uh, th this allows players, basically what it, it really makes the campaign game actually work really well because what it means is when you get to the mid game, players have assets that they can start converting into the second phase of the game if they want to. Um, it also uh, does some really lovely things because this is the only way cash can get into these companies. So if a company can't pay its expenses, and a company's expenses are shares, um, or value, whichever one's higher, plus ships. So this company right now has expenses of seven. If they can't pay seven, they're gonna die. This company was going to fold. And so one player, you know, twirling their mustache over here, might have left a workshop. Aha, I've got a, well, you need some money, I hear. And they can use this to get a share and maybe even to extort yellow into giving up one of yellow's shares. So you get a lot more like hostile takeovers and really interesting uh, elements because because these companies have um, a lot more vested interest like all of these pieces were invested workshops and shares at one point so you have invested capital here you have invested capital of course in the ships that they're leasing and then you have invested capital in the sense that it's been generating value so all of this makes you want to not give up a firm you do not want your firms to fail generally uh, this also creates environments where, where the firms will merge with each other, and there are rules, of, co of course, for mergers and things like that. Okay, my goodness, uh, that was a lot to go through. Uh, I Don't tell you I didn't warn you. This is a weird talk for me, because usually I don't go into like this level of specificity. Uh, but, but one of the things about this title is that we have spent basically a year and a half, two years in the absolute weeds, and especially this past year since last Historicon, uh, we have just every single element in this game has gotten a huge, a huge amount of care. And uh, it's been quite fun to talk about. We had someone on the Whirly Gig Discord ask me today uh, why the hell we added these Consequence of Failure cards, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. And I was able to just answer them because every, I feel like I could, I could go on a rant about every single number and like why, you know, for instance, Bombay has two, three orders and Bengal are... Th Bengal has a five and a six. Um, we've just hammered on, on the, the, the details, and I don't think I've ever worked on a game where I've taken this much care with the design. Uh, and that isn't to say I've been sloppy with the other ones, it's just that I've had the time. Uh, and we've also had a really beautiful, wonderful group of dedicated testers who um, keep playing this game, even though they're like 20 or 30 plays in. 
uh, and there is n nothing better you can ask for as a as a designer or as a as a dev. Uh, now these consequence of failure cards, um, people are probably going to be mad at me on BGG for them, but it's still the right thing to do. Um, when the game ends, so this is this is a thing that was added only somewhat recently, but uh, it, it's tested very well. Um, and, and by recently, by the way, I mean like a month ago. Like it, and, and we still have a month of development, left, so don't worry. It, everything's getting vetted. But when the company succeeds, you go to a final re re retirement where everyone chucks dice for their family members and you make one last jump to try to get into the mansions. Now this um, uncertainty about who's going to win the game is a critical engine for the game's negotiations. And so I've always really liked the final retirement. I think it's an important one of the game. But one thing that we had, what we found was that in company failure scenarios, uh, you could pretty much calculate precisely what a player's score is. So what would happen is the players, you know, they, they'd get their little score and then suddenly, oh, look, the Sykes family is winning by two points and they would just destroy the company because they knew that they were going to win the game by two points. And this felt anticlimactic and it felt like ahistorical and not wrong narratively because if you're going to like tear down Enron or something, if you're going to like just uh, raise a corporation to the ground, um, that is a scary and dangerous thing and sometimes the chips will not fall the way you want them to, to fall. Is that the right metaphor? Probably not. Um, so, we created this little deck called the Company Failure Deck. There are six cards in it and they are all listed. Um, in fact, on the player boards, You'll see that on the right, it tells you what you can transfer, uh, what are your sources of power, what are your sources of victory points, and then at the bottom it says, remember that company success means additional retirement, and company failure means players might be penalized for these things. And so, at the end of the game, if the company fails, you flip one of these cards, careless shipbuilders indicted, lower each player's score, one victory point for each of their shipyards. And that means that, like, if you thought your shipyards were going to carry you to victory, I'm so sorry. And all of these cards have, you know, Parliament exposed, like, oh, the, the players who are passing laws. All of these things are various players who might have been responsible for the company failure. I'm not going to say that they were responsible for company failure, but thankfully, uh, in this instance, um, my role as a game designer is not to be a good historian. It's to be a good um, capture of the public spirit because who who knows who the public is going to blame for the failure of the company? And that's what these six cards kind of capitalize on because maybe it was the British despots of India who caused the company to fail, but it was Parliament who got the blame. And that's just part of the game. And what that means is players who want to tank the company, they really want to have like a four-point buffer or like a six-point buffer which means that the game is just slightly more cooperative. And when I say cooperative, what I mean is tangled, juicy. Players really overlapping their player, player positions and trying to find new spots of leverage so they can get just a little bit farther ahead. Um, okay, well, I hope that gives you a sense of all of the hard work that everyone's done. Again, I want to thank uh, our amazing playtesters. There's like a cadre of maybe 10, 20 people who have been on the Whirly Gig Discord, and they play this game, I do not joke, like every other day there is a game of John Company being played. So if, if you're a backer and you're excited to get your game and you kind of want to play it now, know that right now you're playing something very close to final and you can get into a game basically in any time zone, any day of the, day of the week at the Whirly Gig Discord. Uh, and I also, of course, want to thank my dear brother Drew, uh, without who uh, this game would not exist. Um, he has been so patient with it and has really let this design kind of come into his own. And he's just been an excellent collaborator and has talked about, you know, I, Drew's the person who I can message, you know, any night, any morning, and we can hash it out about, you know, whether or not a number should be a three or a four or something like that. Uh, okay, so with all that in mind, I'm happy to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions if there are any, or wish you all a good night, whatever the mood is. But thank you all for coming. Um, this was a real pleasure for me. And if you don't want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to type questions in the chat.
Oh, oh uh, Brian, I want to say thank, thank you. you for a brilliant talk. Oh, my, my, my pleasure. Uh, Brian asked the question that I was hoping I would remember to answer, which is, uh, what about the windows? What do the windows do? Uh, so the windows are one of my favorite things that was added in the game. Uh, basically, there are these little icons. Here's one on a luxury. Here's one on a, a fairly large house. That Scottish mansion that's somewhere. I don't know what happened to it. Um, it had a bunch of windows on it. Um, the way the windows work is one of the policies is a window tax, which means not only do you have to pay for every top hat you own, you have to pay for every window icon you own. So that if you have a bunch of guys retired at these high spots, these two folks are eight windows combined, which means you need to pay $8 if the windows get taxed. Now, why call them a window tax? Well, in, uh, in England, there was this problem, which is how do you assess the value of a person's wealth in a world before like income tax? You want to create a wealth tax, you don't want to make create a commodity tax because implementing a like a sales tax that's a nightmare. A sales tax means every shopkeeper has to file annually. Like no one, like certainly in Regency England, no one wants to do that. Um, so how do you figure out a way to tax someone based on their wealth without knowing how much they make? And at some point they came up with the idea that uh, you count windows because windows are expensive to maintain. And uh, they're expensive on the heating bill. If you have a lot of windows, you're spending a lot of money heating your home. So the really rich families have a lot of windows. And so there is a thing, you can look at it on Wikipedia or anywhere else, called the window tax, where people would go around and they would just count windows and then they would tax a property based on the number of windows it had. Now you can imagine what people did. Uh, if you wanted to hide your wealth, you bricked up your windows. And in fact, there are these fabulous houses in Bath and in other places in England that have a bunch of windows bricked up for no reason except to evade the window tax. And that was a lovely detail. The window tax just so happens to coincide almost precisely with the game period um, covered by the game. And there is a, a repeal of the window tax um, that is one of the laws in the deck. Here it is, the window tax repeal, which just basically says the players no longer have to pay window taxes if this if this is played. Thank you, Brian, for asking for asking that question. Anyone else? Uh, questions or comments? I'm happy to, happy to take them. Uh, I, I was wondering about um, uh, why you choose... Uh, um, um, oh, sorry, uh, I can't formulate what I want to say. Uh, no worries. Uh, the dice. Uh, why did you choose uh, this, this, this system of taking kicking, kicking the, only the lower and uh, taking yes. a, a one? Uh, no, that's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very, a very good question. Um, of all the things that have changed since the first edition, the dice did not. Uh, and and the um, I uh, had the good fortune to have lunch with uh, a science fiction writer named Kim Stanley Robinson when I was in graduate school. And he was telling me about um, S-curves, this like notion of, of the, the curve of diminishing returns, which he thought was the most fundamental uh, shape in all of policy and nature and just everything. He thought it was a really essential part of just like, of any action was that you had to contend with marginal re re returns. So if you look at the way the system works, if you roll a single die, and uh, you, you can easily tell that uh, your chances of each of the three effects are evenly divided. But if you add a second die, you'll note that your chances of failure go down precipitously, and your chances of success go up by the same measure. Right? So you're basically directly stealing from bottom chances to improve the top chances. And at three dice, you then get another big leap. But it's not quite as big. The difference between 33 and 56 is less, or is more than the difference between 56 and 70. And if you had a fourth dice, now instead of adding uh, four, you know, 14%, you're only adding 10%. And at five dice, you're only adding 7%. Um, and at, at six dice, you only add an additional 4%. So what, what's happening is we're on an S-curve. You, the more money you spend, uh, the less effective the money is that you're spending. And critically, 
uh, you could spend an infinite amount of money and you can never totally eradicate the possibility of total failure. And all of these things mesh together so beautifully that um, it was a real, a real pleasure to just build an entire game on top of the foundation of that, of that curve. Um, but yeah, it's, it is entirely about the, the S curve. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, my, my pleasure. Um, what, one thing that I'll say about the, the full campaign game is that we did speed the game up very slightly. So uh, you'll see on this turn track, 1710 is the first turn, and it ends on the 5th instead of the 6th. So it is a little bit faster. In fact, with experienced players, we I find that the uh, the 1710 scenario usually takes two or two to three hours to play. Um, 1758 is also a five-turn scenario, and it is the hardest and weirdest scenario. And then the seven, the 1813 scenario is like uh, you know they used to call these tournament scenarios in war games where it's like all the all the machines are running. It's like starting you right in the middle of the battle, but it, it's only a four-turn scenario. So the, the the 1813 is like for the real pros who want to jump right to the heart of things. Here's the 1813 scenario. The um, the campaign mode starts at 1710 and proceeds all the way to the 8th turn. Usually it ends somewhere between the 5th and the 8th, but what, what I find happening is that once players become comfortable with the firms, which does not take that long, um, you know, basically I would say your first game, play the 1710. Your second game, probably still play the 1710. And then once you're ready to jump to 1813 or 1858, when you go back to 1710, you'll just always play in the full campaign mode. And sometimes you can play through to the eighth turn, but oftentimes the company collapses b b before then. Um, uh, of all, I would say of all of the campaign games we've seen, it's quite rare for the game to go to its eighth turn, which in fact, it would be beyond 1857 historically. Um, it would be something like, you know, like the 1880s or something, uh, which is a horrifying prospect, honestly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I find that, like, playing with firms is much more the default mode. And, and that, is, that is very exciting for me because, as, just as a designer, one of the weirdest things about this game is I would have people tell me, like, oh, John Cummings, one of my favorite games. And I'm like, oh, what do you think of the other scenarios? And they're like, oh, I've only played the early company scenario. And so I thought, well, that's, that's kind of a bummer. I didn't blame them, though, because the other scenarios aren't, aren't as good as the early company scenario. In this game, I think the campaign game is, is probably the best scenario. I really like... 1758. I think 1813 is especially good if you have a lot, a lot of players. If you have a five or six player table, you know the game well. Um, but uh, it, I think, I think a lot of players who get this are going to feel more empowered to explore the different parts of the design. All right, last call. Uh, Cole, I have a question. Sure. Um, so you mentioned that you have a pretty good uh, playtesting group. Um, what sort of steps do you take to make sure that uh, if people are playing uh, the same game over and over again, that uh, that first they're not that they're not getting burned out, and also that uh, the game isn't kind of biasing itself towards totally. uh, like repeat playings rather than first time players? Yeah, well, so there's a number of things all 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 tied up there. One of them has to do with what. Um, I we sometimes call like a group's meta, so like so I, I think that there it, it is true that games can bias themselves against experienced players versus as new, versus new players, but that's less of a concern because you want I think generally in the 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 world of historic games, especially of this complexity, you really want to reward players for sticking around, and so if the game becomes like very interesting to the people who've played it fifty times. Uh, as long as you're making sure that the on ramps are safe, um, you're you're not really going to run into any problem with the game getting like too esoteric or deep. But you have to really pay attention to like what is it like for a new player to you know, experience these rules or read the rules. Um, and so much of that just has to do with like accessibility studies and making sure to do events like this where. I can, like, one, one of the things that, that Drew and I are paying a lot of attention to, and the reason why I, I've been bopping into Drew's teaches and listening to them, is I'm just looking for places where people are getting confused, and then going into the rules and being like, could this be a little clearer or tighter? 
Um, that that's one big bulwark to keeping it uh, keeping it approachable. Now the question about the meta is a lot harder to answer because what will happen is uh, players might start playing badly or playing in a degenerate way that works that seems like a good strategy, but it's because everyone's playing in a goofy way. Um, and the only the best thing you can do there is um, try to gradually introduce new players to the mix. Uh, one thing I, I did when uh, when I was working on Root. I had I had been slowly building up this cadre of playtesters, and I just put them on a chart. And I said like these are my like first pass playtesters, and these are my like, third plus. And I I really like I knew they were going to be burning out because burnout is a very normal part of playtesting. Heck, it's a normal part of design. Um, there there were times over the past year where I took like a three week break from John Company because I just couldn't look at it. Uh, it and that's completely fine. But you want to be strategic about it and say like okay, I'm gonna I'm going to push myself and then give myself a break during a period where I don't really need to be thinking about the game. And with my playtesters, I would have these waves where I'd say, like, okay, playtesting is slowing down. I'm going to write emails to these five people. And what happens as you build relationships with, with, with people that you play with, you find that some people are a lot better at the early stages when the sky's the limit and you can kind of take suggestions. And other players are really good at, like, the late stages where they're trying to find exploits and things like that. Uh, the other question, the other comment about burnout and avoiding it is, um, I think, has to do with how, it has really changed a lot in the past year. So burnout used to be the thing I worried about the most because I because what happens and this is uh, you know I know a car is, is working on a big game right now, but I'll mention this to everybody so we're all on the same page. Um, a very common thing that happens to designers, especially designers who've had a, a few good games come out, is that all of the playtesters who are combative and kind of irritating and hard to deal with, they all leave. And so you're left with playtesters who are like a little more sycophantic. Um, that's kind of unkind. But like fans. You're like left with, with fans. Um, and that's good, but it can start to bias your playtest groups in really severe ways and make you think that you're something that's brilliant that like maybe is not brilliant um and so burnout was always a very serious problem and i always tried really hard to make the people who were, like crotchety or like I, w I would be irritated by make them feel comfortable and welcoming and I, I was always very appreciative towards them because i wanted them to come back i wanted them to have a good time even if they were sometimes making me wake up in the middle of the night scream screaming um it's you know it's i think it was just, it was just important um however one of the most interesting things about what's happened since the move to digital playtesting is that uh, playtesters are not burning out the way they used to. It used to be that I would get like three iterations per playtester, oftentimes, for, for, for most playtesters. And that's because building a kit is exhausting, and updating it is exhausting. But if you're maintaining a tabletop simulator mod, when a new version comes out, so we used to release our new versions for like Root on like Mondays or Tuesdays. And that gave people, our playtesters, all week to like go to Kinko's and print out the copies and update their edition and then get their group together for Friday night and then they play Friday night. Uh, and then usually I don't want I, I used, to, I used to give a development talk where I talked about how you don't want to iterate more than like once every three weeks because you'll exhaust your playtesters faster. And I had all these charts and I would talk about playtester exhaustion. That doesn't happen anymore. Because now I release my kits on Fridays because people read through the, the patch notes and like good Dota or League of Legends players or Hearthstone players, they see those patch notes and they say, hot damn, I can't wait to get to the game. Let's start playing right now. And they go to the looking for a game channel and they're playing Friday night or Saturday. And this, and in fact, what, what we found with John Company is that our number of active playtesters has dramatically increased the longer development has gone on. Uh, and that, that's because the game is getting closer to done, so it's more accessible and it's easier for people to get in. But it's also just because those old, those older cohorts are not exhausting themselves as, as, as quickly. Uh, and then the very last thing I'll mention just about playtesting generally, and I know there are some established designers who are in this chat as well. I see you, Bruce, and others. Um, play, building a community of playtesters takes a super long time. When I was working on Pamir, I had such a hard time finding testers. I basically had like Drew lived with us for um, for a few months while we were in Austin, 
and I had another group that I would play with sometimes. But I remember I took it to BGG Con and just hit the pavement and played it as much as I could. I scheduled demos constantly, and uh, it, and it was really really hard to get anybody interested. And Infamous Traffic I built mostly at home, my family, and with a very very small group. Uh, and then around the time of John Company, because Premier had been out and traffic had started to do well, I started finding it pretty easy to get playtesters. And then when I went into Root, I had like a group of maybe six groups. And then after Root, it's now very easy to find playtesters for me. Uh, and so when I, when I think about playtesting, the thing that I'm thinking about is, is it possible to share that audience with the widest group? And so like on the World League Discord, we have game design channels and we also have people for games and also you have discords for the campaign and levy series or the coin game series that are really good about uh, playtesters and designers playing each other's work that's one way to to uh, kind of shortcut that process but without that shortcut it's just it takes years to develop a good set of playtesters uh, and it, it seems like there's almost no way getting around that great question Akar. thanks thank you that's a lot to think about yeah, it takes a long time, this old game making. Uh, all right, well, again, thank you all for coming with me on this little trip. Uh, I'm going to be running a public teach of this game tomorrow. It's not a demo, and so I I don't know how it's going to be. It's going to be weird. Uh, but basically, I'm going to try to just, like, teach the entire game. Like, every every little bit of the design is going to be taught. And I'll be giving some examples, but I won't be, like, running a game and so I'm kind of curious, how long will it take me to teach every rules design? <laughs> um, uh, and and that, that will be happening uh, sometime in the, in the early afternoon, I believe. Uh, but again, yeah, this was wonderful. Um, oh, I see some people are typing. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. These, these are always really fun things for me. I come from kind of an academic background. I, I, miss, I miss doing talks. Uh, and I will be, of course, posting this on YouTube uh, eventually for folks who, who are here. All right, well, enjoy the rest of Historicon. Go see some of the Zenobia uh, winners and finalists. Many are being shown. Um, drop in on a game you've never heard of. Uh, there is so much good stuff happening. I really love this, this digital con. It is so special. And I hope you all uh, have a lovely time. All right, take care. <laughs>